Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be doing a BIOS overview for the Gigabyte X470 Ultra Gaming motherboard. So, with a 2700X, because there's obviously some minor differences in the BIOS depending on which CPU you use, but we're not going to go over all of the different CPUs, because that would take for freaking ever. So, and before we get into this, I would like to thank alza.co.uk for loaning me the 2700X that I'm using here. And uh, they're basically a large European retailer for computer hardware. And right now, what's worth noting is they have a sale going on all of their Kingpin cooling LN2 pots and uh, accessories, I think. I'm not sure if the thermal paste is on sale, but I do know the LN2 pots are for sure. And I think even the Inferno socket heaters are also so if you're looking to pick up some you know LN2 pots then this this is a great chance because uh, the they tend to be pretty expensive so yeah and uh, now let's get into the video so here's the BIOS this this is going to be the first screen you get to which is the MIT tab and before we start going through the menu options it's worth noting that if you just press F1 it gives you a general help option right here and uh, you know. You, you can read what's there, so let's move on. Um, so let's start going through the menus. Advanced frequency settings. Here you have Easy Overclock Tuner, which is a bunch of memory presets that I would honestly not use, especially the ones above 3600, because most CPUs won't be able to even post with those. Uh, below that you find the BCLK clock control, so you can adjust your BCLK in steps of... Uh, a tenth of a megahertz, so 10 kilohertz, which is actually very, very fine. Most motherboards don't go um, like that low on the adjustment range. Um, this is very handy if you want to uh, dial in very specific overclocks, like even smaller adjustments than the quarter of a multiplier that you can do with the CPU ratio, or if you're trying to hit a very specific memory clock. Um, this is actually a really cool feature to have. It's just kind of out of place on a motherboard this cheap, in my opinion. Uh, it could potentially be handy if you have like a 2600X and you want to, or a 2600, and you basically want to uh, extend the, the frequency ranges past the stock boost speeds. Um, but the motherboard is kind of underpowered, but it is one of the, like, at, at its price point, I think it's the only motherboard that has a clock gen, so it's kind of a, it's a nice feature to have, it's just kind of odd that it's on this motherboard of all the motherboards it could have been on. So, that's that. Um, oh, and that will overclock everything, so your PCIe, your SATA, your USB, your everything, and it tends to glitch out with M.2 hard drives, from what I've heard, and, uh, also, if you're cranking up the frequency really high, past around, I think, 105.4 megahertz, uh, you need to change your PCIe speed from 3.0 to 2.0, and then I think at 120 plus, you need to drop down from 2.0 to 1.0, or even GPUs will stop working. So, yeah, um, that's basically a really advanced overclocking feature, but it is definitely nice to have. Then you get CPU clock ratio, which just allows you to adjust the CPU core clock. Um, if you set this ratio to anything other than your CPU's base ratio, which for a 2700X here is 37, um, it will, uh, it will pull the CPU in, it'll put the CPU into OC mode, which basically disables all of the power management except C states. Um, so, yeah, do keep that in mind. This is great for if you're trying to do like an all-core overclock. Um, for the first generation Ryzen CPUs, this would be my advised method of, uh, overclocking for um, for the um, for the 2700X though and, and some of the other 2000 series CPUs, this might not be worth it because you're going to lose your single core boost frequency, which tends to be a lot higher than what you can do all core. But uh, yeah, so that's there. Then you get advanced CPU core settings. Here you have core, you get a redundant clock ratio again. Then you get core performance boost, which... Uh, this, basically, if you disable that, the CPU will not go above base clock. So, um, so you'll want to leave that on auto um, if you're not doing manual overclocking. If you are doing manual overclocking, you can disable it because it basically gets disabled anyway. Um, then you get cool and quiet. This, um, if you disable it while you have, with, without an actual manual overclock, what'll happen is you will lose sort of your intermediate frequencies. So your CPU will basically sit at either 2.2 gigahertz or like four gigahertz plus. 
not exactly ideal. So you, I, if you want to actually, you know, have proper power management, you'll want to leave that enabled because the CPU otherwise doesn't tends to, like, it doesn't really have a, uh, it, it stops doing the the mid mid range frequencies. Like it won't boost to like three point, like it won't run three point five gigahertz for lighter workloads or something. It'll just go all the way to four gigahertz all the time whenever it can. So you'll want to leave that enabled most of the time. SVM mode is, uh, I think, for some something related to virtual machines. I'm not entirely sure. Global C states, if you disable this, your idle power consumption is going to suck. So you're going to want to leave that enabled. Uh, you can leave that enabled even when overclocking. So if you you know set your ratio, uh, CPU ratio to like 40x, as long as you keep your C states enabled, your idle power consumption is actually going to be very, and by idle, I mean like sitting at Windows desktop, your idle power consumption is going to be actually very, uh, like completely acceptable. It's not going to be uh, ridiculous. So most of the time, the only time I would disable this is if you're like really pushing some extreme, you know, overclocks or things that are already really unstable because having the frequency going up and down can sometimes cause uh, instabilities. But most of the time, if you're just running daily settings, then you'd want to have this enabled. Um, then you guys power supply idle control. This exists because older PSUs were not really meant to have, well, some older power supplies are not really designed to function with very, very low current output, as in their voltage regulation will not work in such low power output ranges. And for those power supplies, you'd want to have a typical current idle um, and if you have any newer power supply, then you'd actually want to be in low, you want to use low current idle. The actual power draw difference for at least the CPU VRM is like 10 versus 5 watts. But uh, there, as, as I said, there's power supplies where if, if you're only pulling like 5 watts out of the PSU, it does really bad things to the voltage regulation. Like you get way too much or way too little 12 volts or way too much, way too little 5 volts. So that's why that's an option. Most modern PSUs should not require that you adjust this. Um, then you get op cache control, which I don't know what it does. Uh, down core control, where you can enable and disable cores. Um, on some CPUs, like say the 2400G, this will cause crashing if you choo choose to use these. Uh, on some motherboards, it causes crashing. Like it, sometimes it gets fixed, sometimes it doesn't work. So um, yeah, th this is very handy for like uh, for sort of competitive overclocking purposes as well as testing purposes. Not that useful in day-to-day -day usage as you generally want to have all of your CPU cores running all the time. You don't really gain a whole lot of overclocking range by disabling them. And then you get simultaneous multi-threading disable or enable, which is just called auto. Um, this can be worth disabling for some very specific workloads that don't play well with uh, uh, simultaneous multi-threading. But for most users, for daily usage, you'd probably want to just leave that enabled um, as the, you know, the scenarios where disabling this makes sense are very, very rare. So that's that. Then you get extreme memory po profile, which you get memory profiles depending on what your memory kit supports. I'm on a team group 3733 CL18 kit here, so I have a 3733 profile. Um, then you get your memory multiplier. And that's that's that for the, the advanced uh, frequency settings. Then you get advanced memory settings where you get another XMP profile setting, system memory multiplier, um, very granular actually. Goes all the way up to 4200, but that will I think vary depending on which CPU you put in there. I think the first gen CPUs only go to 4000. Uh, then you have memory timing mode, which you want to put into manual if you want to adjust any of your memory timings. Also, if you Go up here, you will see that your profile voltage changes as well as your timings change. But we're just going to disable that. So yeah, for timing options, you have basically everything. Your processor on die termination is down here. You have the full range command rate you have down here. You can set 1T, 2T. Do keep in mind that your command rate is tied to having gear down mode enabled or disabled. The gear down mode is located elsewhere in the BIOS. We're going to get to it. Um, then you have your bus setup timings, bus drive strengths, and your bus configuration at the very bottom here. Um, this is not actually all of the memory settings that the motherboard has. There's a bunch of them bur buried elsewhere in the BIOS, so we're going to get to those. Um, then you get your advanced voltage settings. You have dynamic V core, which is an offset. It goes from plus minus 300 to plus 300. Um, 
This may mean that on some CPUs which have a low vid, you're going to have a very limited maximum vCore. Um, SOC voltage goes from, well, from zero to plus 300. So that one's, you, you can't exactly lower the SOC voltage below what the CPU, the, what the motherboard uh, drop uh, sets. Um, and the motherboard will change your stock, like your base vid, I mean base SOC voltage, depending on what memory ratio you're running. At 3200, your base SOC voltage is going to be 1.1 volts, and below that it'll sort of be up to 1.1 volts. I think 2933 is at 0.95 or something like that. So then, you know, to get the voltage you actually want, you'd have to add the offset on top of that. Um, but yeah, you can't, basically, if you're running 3200 megahertz memory, you cannot set the SOC voltage below 1.1 volts. Then you get CPU VDDP. Um, this is a IO supply voltage. It's also an offset. This voltage generally doesn't do much for overclocking range. So I would not worry about it. It has a very wide voltage setting range, but um, this, this voltage really isn't all that useful in terms of overclocking. Like I've not seen it actually have much uh, impact, like impact on, uh, overclocking range. So I wouldn't worry about that one. Chipset voltage. So this is the voltage your chipset runs on. Um, it only goes, yeah, uh, there. So, okay, wait, we're just going to max out the DRAM and yeah. Okay. So it throws up a warning for that. Honestly, you shouldn't have to upset, uh, set the chipset voltage like ever. Um, one point, like there again, the chipset doesn't really care what what you're doing in terms of overclocking. Maybe if you're doing very heavy BCLK overclocking, it might help to adjust it, but otherwise you shouldn't need to worry about that. DRAM voltage goes all the way up to two volts, which is nice. For daily usage, you're going to want to stick to around 1.5 volts. You also get your DRAM termination voltage, which generally speaking should be point a half of your DRAM voltage. And uh, some memory kits may benefit from tweaking that up and down by uh, 50 millivolts ish. You do not want to exceed 0.95 volts for DRAM termination um, for daily usage. So that's kind of that. And we're going to just set that back to auto. Um, let's go to PC health status. Here you get a voltage readout for all of the different voltages that the motherboard does monitor. Um, keep in mind that the voltage readings you have here in the BIOS are not going to be representative of load or idle Windows idle voltage readings because the BIOS is not quite like it pulls a decent amount of power. So, you know, th these voltages right here are good as a reference. They're good for figuring out the base voltages that your CPU defaults to. So the voltages that you see here when you're like manually overclocking are useful for figuring out what kind of offsets you're supposed to be running. But other than that, not that helpful. Um, but you know, nice to have that in the BIOS and you get miscellaneous settings here. You can change your PCIe generation. So, you know, if you're BCLK overclocking, you're going to want to probably drop it to gen two or even one, if you're really, really pushing it, um, 3d Mark one enhancement. I have no idea what that does because I don't bench 3d Mark one. It's supposed to improve 3d Mark one, uh, benchmark scores. So probably not useful for most people. Yeah, then you get smart fan five settings, which I actually like gigabytes fan control software. Like th this is one of the less janky UIs I've had to deal with. Um, you can put them manual, then you can adjust your fan speed curves with holding the shift key. So that's nice and simple. You can choose uh, which sensor you're pulling from. So if we go to say here, um, obviously the, the CPU fan, right? The CPU fan is tied always to the CPU temperature. So you can't change that one, but it, CPU optional, you can change which one that one goes off of. You can go for, uh, uh, there. And you do have fan control for every fan header on the motherboard. And you go get VRM temperatures. You also have on some of the other sensors, you go as far as EC temp. So there's actually the option to plug in an external temperature probe into the motherboard and that will show up on the AC temp right there. Um, so yeah, you get pretty good, uh, you know, fan control here. You get a temperature interval, which I think is update rate and uh, fan controller mode. So you can choose between DC voltage control and PWM control for the RPM. 
Uh, and then you obviously can have a warning that either, you know, if the fan's not spinning, then enable the warning or disable the warning. So that's there. Also down in the bottom right, you get a nice temperature readout for all of your various temperature sensors that are present on the motherboard. You can see that I don't have the EC temp sensor plugged in because I don't have one. Um, but CPU temperature, VRM temperature, and you have, so VRM MOS is the vCore VRM and VSOC MOS is the VSOC VRM. Um, and both of them are really low because I have a fan sitting on top of them. They do tend to get pretty warm on this motherboard otherwise. So that's the fan control. Um, honestly, I think it's pretty good. Then uh, you get your system here, which tells you some basic information about the BIOS revision and what motherboard you have and all of that. Then you get BIOS options right here where you can change your boot options, uh, priorities, boot numlock state, various boot settings, set a password, that kind of thing. Uh, then you get to your peripherals menu and here things get interesting. So you have the trusted platform module up top, then you have initial display output. So if you have multiple GPUs, you can choose which GPU is the first one to output to the displays. Uh, RGB fusion controls, so you can customize the RGB on the motherboard. Uh, you can enable and disable the LEDs on the board. You have some USB settings um, and just more IO settings, USB settings. It, you can enable, disable HD audio. You can change the voltage for the, um, there's two USB ports on a giga, on these on gigabyte motherboards that have a dedicated 12 volts to five volts buck converter for them. So you can actually change what exact voltage your those USB ports run at. And that might help if you're running like a high power consumption USB device or have a very long USB cable hanging off of those ports. It's meant for, it, it's meant to help with uh, power, well, I, the, the marketing says that it's supposed to help with voltage stability for, um, for uh, if you have external, uh, did, uh, if you have an external sound card running off a USB, then it's supposed to be helpful with that. I've not tested how well that actually works, but you do have the setting for that. Then there's 4G decoding, which I quite frankly have no idea what that does. And now we get into the interesting settings. AMD CBS, um, which I don't know what the CBS stands for, but here you find a lot of fun toys. So Zen common options, you get your custom P states and throttling. I'm gonna tell you this is a waste of time, but uh, you, you can customize your P states if you feel like wasting all your time. Um, Cause there's honestly better ways to get um, power efficient overclocking going on Ryzen anyway. Um, then you have DF common options here. You have some of the memory settings that I mentioned were missing from the advanced memory settings tab in the MIT. So you get your memory interleaving, interleaving size and interleaving hash. I've not tested what these do, but you know, if you know what they do, they're there. UMC common options, you get some more DDR4 uh, settings. So here you have D, uh, gear down mode. And then you finally have your power down, enable and disable. So this is a power saving feature for DDR4. You're gonna want that disabled. It helps with stability um, when overclocking. Um, if you had a laptop, it, you know, if this motherboard was in a laptop, then arguably it would help to have that enabled, but for purposes of desktop, desktop systems, you'd want to have that disabled. Uh, gear down mode obviously is, um, limits what kind of command rate and cast latencies you can run. Uh, above 2666 megahertz. So if you have gear down mode enabled, you're stuck with even cast latencies and you can't run uh, command rate above 1T. If you have it disabled, it may or may not cause boot issues. Some CPUs are weird about it, some aren't. In the past with Ryzen 1000, I never had any issues running it disabled. With the 2000 series, I've had some problems when I've disabled it and then uh, higher memory frequencies wouldn't actually work, whereas with it enabled, they would work. So. Um, you're gonna have to me mess around with this, but basically it's just another memory overclocking option. Um, and then you get DDR4 memory uh, mapping settings, which you just have chip select interleaving, which you can disable or leave on auto, which I assume is enabled because the other option is disable. Um, so that's that. And then you get NBIO common options. Here you get uh, CTDP control. So basically you can set a custom TDP for your CPU. Um, and basically if you set it to say 50 watts, you're if, with a 2700X, it'll force the 2700X to run on 50 watts, which is actually really neat. This works really, really well. 
the CPU will literally downclock itself until it pulls 50 watts. Um, I'm not sure why you'd actually want to do that in a desktop, but maybe in some ITX builds or something like that where your very cooling limit, well, nah, nah, I still don't see it because you'd ultimately just temperature throttle anyway. But you do get to, you do have the option to customize your CPU TDP. Setting this above the CPU's stock uh, power power limit, like say if I set it to, yeah, let's set it to like 200, doesn't tend to do anything in my experience. Like I've not seen it actually have an impact on how the CPU runs. So that's that. And let's put that back to auto. Then you have processor temperature control. You can set that to manual. Uh, you can set a custom temperature limit of, uh, I wonder where this ends. Yeah, um, basically you could potentially kill your CPU if you wanted to. I would recommend that you just leave that on auto as well, unless you have a very specific reason why you would need a, well, you could use it to give yourself a lower uh, maximum temperature. So like setting it to 85 um, for safety, if you're cooling limited or you're running really high voltage, so you can't allow the temperature to get as high because obviously at high voltages, high temperatures cause more damage than at low voltages. Otherwise, laptop CPUs would all die. Um, so that's that. Um, and then you get precision boost override configuration, which gives you a nice big disclaimer, which we're gonna ignore. And then you get precision boost override enable, uh, disable, en enable, well, and then you get manual. And if you set manual, you can adjust the power limit the thermal design current limit and the electrical design current limit. Um, these all go up to 65,536. Th wait, 65,535, there. Made a mistake, I forgot about the zero. So yeah, those can go pretty high. Um, honestly, I've run like 500, 500 everything. Um, but yeah, so you can customize these. I've not, like, I'm still in the process of testing how well these work, so yeah. I'm just gonna put that back to auto, and then you get your precision boost override scaler, which you'd need the precision boost override enabled for that. And then you can put it to manual or disabled, but manual, and then you get the full scaler range all the way up to uh, 10x, which basically all that tends to do is give you a hell of a lot more voltage for any given frequency. Um, and it slightly helps your all core boost. Your single core boost basically doesn't change even if you have this completely maxed out from all of my testing, which is why I'm so disappointed in it because it's like, I, I was hoping it would do something about the, the fact that the CPU is kind of reluctant to run at 4.35. It doesn't do that. It just gives you a hell of a lot more voltage. If anything, if you set this really high, you end up with a lot of power limit based throttling, which is just kind of, uh, and temperature based issues. So. Yeah, th this, honestly, I would, in my, like, in my testing, I've not used the scaler very much. Like, I've just left it at 2x and then messed around with the BCLK and the, um, and the other core uh, frequency settings in the CPU overclocking options. That's that. And then you have mode zero, which I have no idea what it does. So, those, those are those options. Then you get some settings for your, uh, onboard network controller. So the Intel uh, network controller that this comes with. And then you get some cr trusted computing options, which uh, I don't know anything about either. Then you get your chipset settings where you can mess around with your SATA configuration as well as IO MMU, which I again don't know what it does. This is an overclocking channel, not hard drive stuff. Um, then you get power settings. So you can basically, if you cut AC power, if the system comes on when the AC power is restored or stays off, um, ERP, I don't know what that does. Um, power button, you can have a delayed power button, which is neat. Um, don't know what that does. And, uh, Resume by time, which uh, should be self-explanatory. Wake on LAN, high precision invent timer, enable, disable, and no idea what that does. 
And then you get your save and exit menu where you can save profiles. There's not that many of them on, the, well, this motherboard is actually pretty decent. There's some boards that only go to like six. This has eight. You can also save to a USB drive. Um, and then you can just do new file and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, it'll save a profile like that. And then if you want to load the profiles, then you can select a uh, file in HDD USB and we can see our profile right there, which we just created. Um, or you can, or if you, you know, save a profile in one of these, like that, you can load a profile from the onboard profiles like that. So that's that. And I think that pretty much covers the entire BIOS. I'm actually surprised I managed to get through that so quickly. Um, yeah, other than that, it's worth noting that you have Q flash on F8. So if we go to F8, you have the BIOS update options, um, where you just update BIOS by selecting the BIOS file on your USB stick, and then um, it verifies. But I've already used this BIOS, so we're just going to escape that. And uh, yeah, that, that covers it. Honestly, I'd say... As far as uh, features go for this BIOS, my only complaints are you have no static voltage control. Um, and other than that, it's basically pretty feature complete to me. Um, I'm kind of annoyed that the in AMD CVS, there doesn't seem to be, just making sure I didn't miss it. Um, yeah, it's missing. So uh, there's no EDC current throttling disable, which, um, yeah, that's some other boards have that. This one evidently doesn't, um, which basically gives you better, like the CPU boosts higher if you just disable that on all cores because it basically lifts some of the current limit restrictions. And the 2700X, if you lift the current limit restrictions, tends to pull a hell of a lot of current. So, well, actually, it tends to pull a hell of a lot of current all the time. And then when, once it hits the limits, it slows down until it gets back under them. So... That's kind of that. So EDC throttling disable would be nice to have, but honestly, you can you can get far with what's in the BIOS. Um, it's just a bit uh, fiddly with the offset voltages and the, the the fact that they buried some of the memory settings like a mile away from the rest of the memory settings. So yeah, that covers it. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's it for the video. Thanks for watching. Like, share, subscribe if you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for how to improve this, because this honestly is like the first time I've done an actual straight up BIOS overview and not like a overclock like not like an overclocking guide because I've I need to get through these motherboards faster. So overviews like this, if you think this works, I'd love to hear about it. If you think this is not detailed enough, because there's a lot of settings where I'm just like, I have no idea what that does, but if you wanted it, it's there. Um, though, again, the other issue is I don't know if those settings work because that's the, sometimes you have motherboards where the setting is in the BIOS and then you try to use it and it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of a problem, but I'm, I'm, I'm limited on time. I have way too many motherboards, um, and testing literally everything is just not going to happen. So I hope what I've covered here is enough, and then I'll do a more general overclocking guide sometime down the line when I've figured out how I actually want to do that overclocking guide, because so far I've still not made up my mind about what you should exactly do. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of that. I'd love to basically hear your comments on all of that. And if you'd like to support what I do here with actually hardcore overclocking, I have a Patreon, I have a PayPal, I also have t-shirts you can buy. There's a link to all of that down in the description below. And uh, that's it for the video. Um, thanks for watching and goodbye.